Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our first Fireside Chat of the new year. We are absolutely thrilled to have Mr. Charles Bolden with us today. Mr. Bolden is a former NASA administrator and also the first African-American to lead the agency uh, on a permanent basis. He's also a retired United States Marine Corps Major General, big deal, and also a former astronaut. Like, come on, this is amazing. So we are super excited to have you with us today, Mr. Bolden. And we have um, some questions for you. And we also have some questions that our students submitted. And we just really want to hear about your experience. So Mr. Sure. Bolden, what did you want to do? Or what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, you know, it, that's a great question because um, it gives me an opportunity to talk about how I failed at becoming what I wanted to be. Growing okay. up in, I grew up in the segregated South. So I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, my mom and dad were teachers, so I knew that I wanted to do something that would, that would help other people. I was kind of oriented towards service uh, right off the bat. I, I watched them work, though, and I, I saw how hard teachers work and how little money they got paid. So that was not one of the things that I was thinking about doing. But um, eventually, I thought I wanted to be an engineer. I had toyed with the idea of being a doctor. And then in, at the age of 12, I saw a program on television called Men of Annapolis about life at the Naval Academy. And that changed everything. I didn't know anything at all about the Navy, didn't know anything about the, the Academy, but I was fascinated by the, the television series. And I decided that's where I want to go to school. And so from seventh grade on, I started working toward getting, uh, you know, an appointment from a from a congressman or or the vice president of the United States or somebody to the Naval Academy. I finally ended up going there. It was really tough. Um, I, I remember calling my parents all the time my freshman year saying I want to come home. I made a big mistake. But the thing that was steady for me there was my first company officer it was a, a Marine major by the name of Major John Riley Love, who really, really, really impressed me. He was tough, like my dad, but eminently fair. And so four years later, when it was time to graduate, uh, I decided something very radical. I had said when I left high school, two things I will not do. I will not become a Marine because they're crazy. And I definitely will not fly airplanes because that's inherently dangerous. And um, at the end of my time at the Naval Academy, I looked back and I said, I want to be like him. So I decided to go into the Marine Corps. Um, wanting to be an infantry officer, but then I found out during training that I did not like crawling around in the mud. Mm. And Mrs. Bolden, who you know very well, was my wife by then. And she really didn't like the idea of me being an infantry officer. So she suggested we go to Pensacola, Florida, and I go to flight school. And I said, but I don't want to do that. She went out, uh, as usually is the case. And we went to Pensacola. And the first time I got in an airplane, I fell in love with it. So that was sort of the beginning of um, you know my Marine Corps career and my beginning in aviation. So uh, I wanted to be an electrical engineer, never became one because I became a Marine aviator and spent 34 years in the Marine Corps. So I, I say all that to say to the kids, don't ever say no or don't ever say never, um, you know, kind of follow your passion, do the things that you like doing and you enjoy doing. And that's, that's what I did. And that's what led me to 34 years in the Marine Corps and eventually to space. Wow. Yeah. So that is a very poignant point. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an attorney and yeah. I actually went to college and I studied English with the intention of going to law school, but exactly. fell in love mm -hmm. with literature and then fell in love with education. And here we are 20 years later, still working with children. So <laughs> Fantastic. Um, how would you say growing up in the South in the 60s um, influenced you and how did you um, sort of how did it shape you into who you are? Mm -hmm. um, because of segregation and Jim Crow laws, there were places we knew we could not go and things that we knew we could not do. And, and you know, until, until the civil rights era really came into its own and we started uh, marching and demonstrating and demanding that we be able to do things, um, you, you really didn't worry about things that you couldn't do. Today is a lot different. Uh, you know, kids are, are exposed to everything, have access to everything, at least on the surface they do. But then they go and find that, well, I'm not welcome there or people really don't want me there. So I would say my growing up was maybe a little bit easier in, in, de in deciding where I was going to go and what I was going to do. It taught me to be tough and resilient. Um, it taught me to never give up on something that I wanted to do, because even though people told you you couldn't do it, there was almost always a, a, a way around what, what people said when they told you not to. 
And the biggest thing was my mom and dad, I mentioned the fact that they were teachers. Um, you know, they always told my brother and me, you can do anything you want to do, but you've got to be willing to study and work hard. And the most important thing is never, ever, ever be afraid of failure. Don't let somebody tell you what you can't do. You may not make it the first time, but if you keep going, if you're persistent, uh, you'll eventually get there. And uh, so I kind of, that was what I grew up with. And that was what gave me the kind of the impetus and the push to go, even when people said no, to keep asking until you got it. So Mr. Bolden, um, can you talk they to- call me little... Charlie Brandolin. I, okay, Charlie. <laughs> Sorry, um, I was raised by a Southern grandmother, so- I know, no. I know. <laughs> Charlie, I'll, I'll work on that. Um, so a lot of what we do with our students, especially in our city leaders program, is we talk to them about college, right? And so how to choose a college, how to choose a major. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you majored in in undergrad and how it prepared you for your future career? Yeah. Well, remember, I wanted to be an electrical engineer. That I did know going to the Naval Academy. So that's what my courses were geared toward. I took a lot of math, a lot of science and everything. And, uh, and I had trouble with a course uh, in my junior year, which, which I ended up not passing. Uh, it was called Electromagnetic Waves Theory 2. And uh, it was a requirement if I were gonna uh, get a major in electrical engineering. There was only one professor who taught it. You probably can relate to this. And he and I did not get along. I figured I could take that course for the next 80 years and I'd never pass it. And so when given an opportunity to do just that, I said, no, I'll just keep my F and I'll press on. And I ended up graduating with a minor in electrical science, but it was still in the area of electrical engineering. So that was what I studied at the Naval Academy. It came in handy because when I decided I was going to flight school, um, that was a STEM curriculum, if you will. Flight school teaches you about meteorology and oceanography. You learn about propulsion systems and electrical systems and everything. So the Naval Academy was an excellent preparation for me going to flight school. Wow. I was an English major, as I mentioned. And so I took the required minimum requirements for math classes. And that was all they were getting out of me. I must admit, you know, my mom was a librarian. So mm -hmm. she had been a librarian at elementary, middle school, and finally high school level. She founded the first school for Black students, not the first school, first library for Black students at, at the oh. elementary level at Waverly Elementary School back in, in 1940 when she came out of college. Um, and she went through, when they finally integrated the schools in South Carolina, she was selected to be the first Black librarian to move into a formerly all-white school. So she made her mark there, and that made a mark on me. Um, the fact that they taught me always treat people well, always, um, whenever you're in charge, take care of your people. Don't worry about yourself. Take care of your people and they'll take care of you. So I learned those kinds of things from my mom and dad. Wow, that's wonderful. You just know, or know the impact you're going to have on someone. So you're absolutely correct. Treat everyone with respect and kindness. And, you know, just I just treat everyone equally. It doesn't matter who you are, what you have. We're in the same room. Let's, you know, choose each other with kindness. So I love that. Um, do you have any advice for our students on um, that don't know what major they want to or what career they want to pursue or, you know, how to kind of come to those decisions? Yeah. I think it's great if they don't if they don't know leaving high school what it is that they want to ultimately pursue. I think that's great. I believe that kids should go to college to find themselves. Mm. Uh, they should go there freewheeling, uh, you know, as you can say from going to Xavier, and even I can say from going to the Naval Academy. Half of the fun of college is just running wild. Everyone, <laughs> uh, and, you know, measured wild, but. But if you go there with political beliefs well established, not being able to listen to the ideas of others, um, that's why we're where we are today. I think it's good for a kid to go to college kind of wondering what they want to do, use their freshman year to feel it out, take as, take as diverse a, a curriculum load as you can in your freshman year, and then you can decide what your specific major is going to be. Now, you may know that I know I want to major in something that's science oriented or STEM oriented, or I know I want to major in something that's in the humanities, but still don't make up your mind until you've had a chance to float through your, you know, your freshman year and then say, okay, now I know I want to major in literature or I want to major in history. I think that's the best thing to do. 
And I think a lot of what a lot of students, especially I was a first generation. Um, and so a lot of our first generation students don't know is that your first two years yeah. are general education, yeah. right? You got to get those math classes out of the way. You got to get those English classes out of the way. And that's why community college is such a great option for some students, because it's literally those first two years at a reduced price where yeah. you're you know, able to transfer with a major because she's like, okay, I've gone through all these things. I really love math. Let me go ahead and major in that, you know? So you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned junior college or community college mm -hmm. because college is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, a student that's kind of figuring, trying to, trying to determine, should I go to college or should I go into the marketplace already? Um, junior college or community college is a good start. It's a little bit less stressful on the, on the wallet. And if you mm -hmm. do well enough in community college or, or junior college, um, chances are you'll get a scholarship. So that'll also decrease the, the burden financially on your parents or you in getting through college. Absolutely. So after I was living my best life at Xavier, um, <laughs> when I was asked not to return um, because of my GPA, I went to community college and I was able to start over. And while, yes, I'm very proud of my degree from Berkeley, I'm even more proud of my degree from Citrus College because that's where I was able to get it together. And I had to pay for that tuition myself. So it became very serious. So as you mentioned, college is not for everyone, right? And so at Flock, we really try to help students focus on something beyond high school, right? Mm -hmm. So the military, you know, is a wonderful option. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, if a student is interested in the military, what's any advice for students who might be interested in joining the military? I believe that at some point, whether it's right after high school or right after college, every student in the U.S. ought to have to take a two-year break and do public service. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be military, it could be Peace Corps, it could be, uh, you know, if they're coming out of college, it could be the Cheat Teach for America, mm -hmm. something that allows you to do service to other people. If you're a relatively good student, look at the service academies because it's college as you begin your military career, whether it's West Point or the Air Force Academy, Coast Guard Academy, Naval Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, you're getting a college education, but you're also getting the military training so that you can go and spend a minimum of four to five years as an officer, as a commissioned officer in the military. But, but it gives you a good solid foundation. And the most important thing is it teaches you leadership, uh, which is something that is gonna be applicable no matter what you do in the workforce. I don't care whether you're a box loader or whether you're a, you know, the CEO of a company, it all gets down to people and it all gets down to your ability to lead people, to inspire them and get them to trust you and be willing to follow you. So Charlie, um, you were nominated by our forever president, Barack Obama, to be the NASA administrator in 2009. And after your Senate confirmation, as I mentioned, you became the first African-American to head this agency permanently, on a permanent basis. Can you talk to us about you know, how that felt and how it feels to be that trailblazer yeah. to be that person who you know was the first well first of all was, i was shocked um <laughs> I, I was i was mesmerized to be quite honest just to be invited to come to washington and talk to president obama and and when i came and talked to him the first time it was about a 25 minute conversation and he did not mention nasa administrator he did most of the talking and he talked about his vision for the agency he talked about what had inspired him as a kid, how he remembered growing up in Hawaii with his grandparents, how his grandfather put him up on his shoulders as a kid, taking him down to the pier to see the, the aircraft carriers come in with the Apollo astronauts, uh, you know, who had just come back from the moon and stuff and how inspiring that was to him. And he really wanted American kids and kids around the world to be able to, to feel that same inspiration that he did. Um, several months later, I got a call that said he had, he had decided he wanted to nominate me to be the the, the administrator of NASA. Having an opportunity to work for President Obama was just flabbergasting. Um, you know, he and Mrs. Obama, they touched everybody in a very special way and working for him uh, was just special. So if we could talk a little bit about your time as an astronaut. Mm -hmm. I remember as a kid um, in elementary school, like watching the spaceships take off, but I never really understood. How does one become an astronaut? I'll tell you what, I didn't have any idea either. <laughs> When I graduated from the Naval Academy, in fact, before I graduated from the Naval Academy, um, we already had Mercury, Gemini, Apollo astronauts. And it was the year after I graduated 
that we first went to the moon, 1969. And I was in flight school at the time. But strangely, I had no desire to be an astronaut. That was just not something that interested me. I had, I had finally decided that I wanted to fly airplanes in spite of what I said coming out of high school. And even after that, after I got my wings, I decided I wanted to be a test pilot. So I was headed down the track of what most astronauts, what most people did to become astronauts in those days, but I was not doing it because I wanted to be an astronaut. I was just, again, following my passion, following the things that I really enjoyed. What changed things for me was when NASA finally selected their first group of people to fly this new thing called the space shuttle. We hadn't flown it yet, but NASA selected a group of 35 uh, young men and women, and it was different than any other astronaut class because it had three blacks, six women, and it, it was a totally new day for the space program and for the astronaut corps. Among those was Ron McNair, Dr. Ron McNair, who became my hero, my role model and everything. He was black like me, had grown up in Lake City, South Carolina, about 42 miles from me. Everything about him was me, uh, except for the fact that he wanted to be an astronaut and I didn't. <laughs> but, uh, but he happened to come to the to the Naval Air Test Center and flew in in the backseat of a NASA T-38, a supersonic jet. Wow. And I saw this black guy get out of the backseat of this jet. And I mean, I knew we had three in the program, never expected that I would meet one of them. And there was Ron McNair. And I ran over and, and we started talking. We talked the whole weekend. And I was, I was really impressed with what he was doing. <laughs> and uh, before he got ready to go back to Houston that Sunday, he, he asked me, uh, he said, hey, are you going to apply for the space program? I said, not on your life. And he was startled. He said, why not? Uh, we had this conversation. I, I thought you liked what I was doing. I said, I did. I said, but I have no desire to be an astronaut because they never picked me. And he said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. How do you know if you don't ask? Mm -hmm. and, and that embarrassed me more than anything else because I had forgotten what my mom and dad had taught me growing up, that you can do anything you want to do if you're willing to work really hard and study hard and not be afraid of failing, you know, not be afraid of people telling you no, because you know that you're gonna keep going, keep going, keep going. And so I was so embarrassed that when he left, I went and got my pen and paper and, and I put my application in. It went through the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps nominated me to NASA and NASA invited me to come down and interview in Houston, Texas. Months went by and finally the end of May, the same couple of days before my wife's birthday, I got a call from Houston saying, hey, do you still want to be an astronaut? And I said, ooh, yes. So wow. that was how I got into the space program. And it was absolutely fantastic. You know, we, we came together as a group. We, we trained together. We traveled together and got to know each other. And, um, and then after a year, when we finally got like Ron had done, then we became eligible for flight assignments. And, and, um, and then I subsequently flew four space shuttle missions while I was in the program. So, wow, that's fascinating because I never knew, you know, what the trajectory was. Like, I just yeah. saw astronauts, you know what I mean? So okay. I had been in training for almost five years and my flight assignment was to fly in 19, end of 1995. We were going to fly um, in December of 1995. We, we were in there, we, we went through the count and got down to 14 seconds and all of a sudden everything stopped. And we saw the, we saw the countdown clock go cycle back to to T minus nine minutes and just kind of flip. And we knew we weren't going anywhere. <laughs> and so they had a technical problem that day, decided that, okay, we're, we're close to Christmas. So why don't we just let everybody relax, go home and, and we'll come back and try it in the new year. And we went to the vehicle four more times after that, three of them unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. And then our fifth time climbing into the vehicle on January the 12th, 1986, we launched and uh, ended up spending five days in space. And I was about as, I mean, I was up here. You couldn't be happier or more excited. And then 10 days later on January 28th was when we lost Ron McNair and the crew of Challenger. So, mm -hmm. so my, my euphoria over my first space mission uh, ended 10 days after, you know, after that flight because I had lost my very best friend and my mentor and role model. It didn't take us very long to decide. We had to figure out what had gone wrong and we had to correct it so that we could go back and fly because we owed it to Ron and the crew. And, um, you know, we weren't going to quit. We weren't going to yeah. be deterred. And that's what we did. And I flew three other flights after that. And where did you go on your first mission? Did you just like... Well, the, the space shuttle was an orbital spacecraft. So okay. it meant it... That, and that that will help people understand why eventually we, we retired the space shuttle. The shuttle wasn't designed to do anything except orbit Earth. That was its mission, to take people into low Earth orbit 
service uh, the International Space Station, build and service actually, or to get satellites into space. It was incredibly successful. We were able to finish the construction of the International Space Station, which today still orbits Earth at about 250 miles above Earth. And it's been there for more than 21 years. Let me show, for kids who may not know, that's Earth from space. That was on my second flight after we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope. So that's the James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope. Those are people right there. So that'll show oh, you. Wow. How big, that, that'll show you how big James Webb really is. These are the 18 segments of the mirror that were all folded up like an origami character to uh -huh. fit into the nose cone of a rocket. That's the International Space Station. So this orbits Earth today at about 250 miles above Earth. And it carries a crew of normally seven people, um, but nowadays we're growing it to eight, nine, even 10 people that live and work on this thing for six months at a time. From wow. here, from this end, all the way to that end, it's about the length of a football field. So if we took this to, to FedEx field and tried to drop it down, uh, the edges would be in the end zone seat, seats. You know, that's what we, we built with the space shuttle. And then once that was done, we retired the space shuttle and we started then turning to the commercial sector, private sector, SpaceX, Boeing, to provide <laughs> transportation for people and things to space. So, so the government doesn't do that anymore. So your kids that wrote this book, uh, I have to put in a plug for yes. We Matter, <laughs> okay, my favorite book, um, you know, about six of our kids. Mm -hmm. um, th these kids, should they decide that they wanna go to space, they're going to go on a SpaceX rocket or a Boeing rocket or something else. They may be NASA astronauts, but they're going to go there on a commercially provided rocket. And then some of them are really going to go to the moon and then on to Mars. So I feel different up there. Or how does was, that work? When I was flying the space shuttle, when we were flying the space shuttle, a typical mission was anywhere from a week to say 16 days. That was about as long as the station as the space shuttle could stay in space. Today on the International Space Station, uh, it's been there 21 years and people generally stay on it. A normal mission is six months and wow. time on the International Space Station because you're you're not really that far away from Earth. So a typical day is a 24 hour day. Um, we generally work about 12 of those about, you know, half of that time you're working. Saturdays are kind of light and Sundays are generally days off uh, to kind of keep keep up with what people are doing down here today. Unlike when I flew on the shuttle. Um, you know, communications is normal. So every crew member has their own laptop. Wow. Uh, a lot of crew members have their own cell phones. And so they communicate uh, just like we do it. Granted, it's over the internet, but they communicate with their families every day uh, as they see fit, either like this over FaceTime or, mm -hmm. or just plain old email, or they make a phone call. And we wow. couldn't do that when I was flying. We had to go through a big elaborate system and all that stuff. So when you return, how, like, do you have to adjust? Like, what type of adjustments does your body have to make when you return? And the human body goes through adjustments both going to space, mm -hmm. and then, as you might guess, it has to reverse all that. So, big adjustment going to space is just the fact that because you're going so fast, we're going 17,500 miles an hour, and this force that most of our kids haven't learned about yet called centrifugal force. When that happens, your inner ear is always the balance mechanism is always looking for a gravity vector and there is none in space because of centrifugal force. So you lose your ability to tell up or down. Uh, so, you know, you oh, wow. turn your head sideways and you don't know that you're sideways. Some people get a little disoriented or sick. Some people even throw up. Uh, we call it space adaptation syndrome. That goes away after a couple of days. Mm -hmm. The other thing is your body gets accustomed to being weightless. So um, you know, there is no, you don't feel any, any, you don't feel any heaviness or anything. Mm -hmm. um, we do lots of exercises coming down to try to get accustomed to weight again, because once we get into the atmosphere, we can feel gravity starting to take over again. When mm -hmm. you land, your hands are really down on the, on the console and it feels like you got gorillas sitting on them or something. You get accustomed to being back in gravity from a weight standpoint over a couple of hours. Oh, okay. takes, a few, takes a few days for your balance mechanism to get back though. After you do all your debriefs and all that kind of stuff, which lasts mm -hmm. about a week, they mm -hmm. give you a good bit of time off. And then you go right back to work because you, you have about a month when you're given over to the communications folk 
to do public affairs events and mm -hmm. travel around the world, if you will, to, to talk about what you did during your mission. This is fascinating. Like my mind is blown. I remember it and I cannot remember what year it was. I've been racking my brain, but I, I went to high school in Southern California and there was, I don't remember what the situation was, but they were driving a space shuttle down the streets oh, yeah. of Los Angeles. And I remember like just seeing this and they shut down their freeways and this the streets. Was, this was 2011. We landed the last space shuttle Atlantis uh, in July of 2011. And then what we did was with the four vehicles that we had, we had three vehicles that flew, Atlantis, Discovery, and Endeavor. Endeavor, mm -hmm. you saw going down the street of streets of Los Angeles and yes. Inglewood and everywhere, yes. all the way over to the Science Museum, uh, right next to the Coliseum in South, right, right around the University of Southern California campus. People who lived back here then were fascinated because we flew the shuttle Discovery from Cape Canaveral up here, and we flew it down the mall uh, at mm -hmm. low altitude. So mm -hmm. people in the mall and all over DC could see this space shuttle on the top of the 747. Yeah, they, were, they were happy. They circled around, came back, uh, went down the mall again, and then flew up and landed at Dulles. And they took it off the top of the 747. And so when, when your students go up to Udva Hazi, which is the Smithsonian up at Dulles, mm -hmm. um, and go in, the, the space shuttle they see is actually the shuttle Discovery. And that's the space shuttle I flew on twice. Wow. So we, put, we put the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit. That was my first flight on Discovery. And mm -hmm. my last flight on Discovery was the first joint Russian-American mission where we actually had a Russian cosmonaut who flew as a member of our crew. Okay, so we asked our uh, Flock family on Instagram and our students to submit some fun questions for our favorite astronaut. But um, I recently saw a video where an astronaut snuck a gorilla costume. Gorilla suit. Did you yeah. see that? <laughs> that is Scott Kelly. Scott Kelly's brother, twin brother, is Senator Mark Kelly from Arizona. Senator Kelly sent a gift, up, a package up to his, his twin brother, Scott, mm -hmm. getting ready for Christmas time. Mm -hmm. When Scott opened it up, it was a gorilla outfit. And so Scott figured, okay, what the heck? If they allowed him to send it, they must not mind my wearing it. So mm -hmm. he put it on and came floating through the cabin uh, one day and it, and it got caught on film. And then the other those, those, that was swimming away from him. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I believe there was um, some sort of video or footage of astronauts drinking Tang and making Tang on um, flights. Do you think that that is real? Do astronauts really drink Tang? We don't, we don't drink Tang, at least we don't now. It was, there was, there were a couple of things that are kind of urban legend, like right. astronaut ice cream. They, you can buy yes. astronaut ice cream in the Smithsonian and, and uh, at the space centers and stuff like that. I don't ever remember eating astronaut ice cream. I don't think we ever took it because it's really not ice cream. Right. And we also, not very many of us like Tang. So we never took, on my four flights, we never took any Tang. We, we did take fruit, dr fruit drinks. Okay. They were powdered like Tang, mm -hmm. but, but never Tang. Uh, allegedly, Tang was flown during the Apollo era, but I'm, I've not been able to, to prove that. Okay, got it. That's where it came from. So um, one of the students asked, what is the coolest thing you've seen in space? And what is your favorite thing about space? Ooh, my favorite thing about space has to be, next to being able to float, has to be the incredible view of our planet that you get. You know, every time you look out the window, it's, it's, it's breathtaking. It never gets old. Um, the human eye is an incredible set of cameras. That, that's the most spectacular thing is seeing our earth and gaining an appreciation for it from that vantage point. We see 16 sunrises and sunsets every normal earth day. Wow. We go around earth once every 90 minutes. So that part is spectacular. That, that's among the, when I talk about the views of earth that are absolutely breathtaking, it's sunrise and sunset. They never get old. Uh, there are no two that are alike. And each one of them just takes your breath away. Well, I'll ask you one more question and then we'll get a little bit of advice. I don't want to hold you up all day because this is no, fascinating. No, 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 this is good. <laughs> uh, Charlie, what is the temperature like in space? Oh, the temperature in space is uh, pretty cold. Temperatures get down. They, they don't get to absolute zero, but they get pretty close to it. So a, a spacewalk crew member who's out outside the space station doing a spacewalk, when they're in the sunlight, because of the heat from the sun, they can feel 250 degrees on the outside of the suit. The suit protects them 
when they go on the, the 45 minutes that we're on the dark side of Earth, it gets down to like minus 250. So the, uh, a spacewalk crew member in, in their suit experiences a 500 degree temperature swing every hour and a half. But in the space suit, because we, we wear this, it's, a, it's called a liquid cool ventilating garment. And it's, it's like a long, pair of long johns that has hundreds of feet of rubber tubing running through it that carry mm -hmm. water. And the water, the, the crew member can adjust the temperature of the water up or down to keep their body comfortable. So space is really wow. cold, really cold. And that's yep. what they wear underneath the, so the spacesuits that we see with the, the helmets, with the bubble, yep. that's yep. what they wear underneath. That's wow. what they wear underneath to, to keep them comfortable as the outside of the, the suit goes through the big 500 degree temperature swing every, every hour and a half. All right, well, I'll stop complaining about it being 30 degrees over here. Oh, <laughs> you, you, don't want to. you know, there's, um, there was an idea, you know, for the kids, let me, let me go back one more time. You mentioned temperature and I want to show them this. Mm -hmm. This is time-lapse photography of Earth. And uh, when we talk about climate change, mm -hmm. um, this is a, the way Earth looked in 1880. I mean, that long ago, it was relatively temperate. Uh, blue and white is, is good temperature. The yellows are a little bit extra hot. Mm -hmm. We don't want it to be that way. But, but watch what happens coming up to about 2015. Because of gases that have trapped heat into our atmosphere, Earth began to warm right about the turn of the wow. end of the industrial age. And so today you can see where our planet is getting warmer and warmer and warmer and all the way up to where we are today. And it's going to be really ugly. So oh, wow. this, this is 2015 right here. The last time we did this and that says we're in trouble. Yeah. So, you know, when every year, it's warmer than it's ever been in recorded history. You just mm -hmm. saw what happened as, as our earth grew and grew and grew, and that's not good. So, you know, our students are aware of this and they are really climate conscious mm -hmm. and, uh, and they really wanna protect earth and they've got the right idea. We just need to listen to them, uh, you know, to take away greenhouse gases, uh, become very energy cons conservationist, uh, become environmentalist, if you will, to keep the environment clean because- wow. You can't get away from it. You know, uh, the one thing you learn about being in space is we have one atmosphere, goes around Earth. What we do in one part of the world eventually will get to another part. We have mm -hmm. one ocean, but if you pollute one part of the one part of that ocean, eventually it'll work its way around the world to the right. other part. So we've got to be we've got to be environmentally conscious. Wow. Yeah, I remember when um, we had the complete shutdown for COVID. How yep. great the air quality got. It and was. You can, see, you can see mountains for the first yeah. time ever. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating. And, and really I mean, we weird. don't, you know, we don't have to move to not doing anything. We don't need right. to go back to the 20 to the 1920s. Right. But we need to be much smarter about how we use energy and what forms of energy we use and what kind of propel propulsion systems we use and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. Wow. Well, this has been absolutely incredible do you have any last bits of advice or, or uh, little comments that you have for our students before we go uh, I'll, I'll leave them with um, my word my three words of it well not three my three pieces of of and I don't give advice but things that by which I live okay. and, and I got them from my mom and dad study really really hard you know you all in that's one of the tenets of flock is to teach them how to study so study hard uh, work really hard at whatever you do, um, whether it's on the playground, at sports, or in the classroom. Um, you can't expect to be the world's best quarterback if you don't practice throwing the ball. You definitely can't expect to be the world's greatest scholar if you don't get your face in a book, you know, or in the computers or something like that. And then the most important thing is never be afraid of failure. Just, you know, if you don't try hard, you won't fail which means you're not making any progress. So I won't say seek failure, but don't be afraid of it. Don't run away from it. Really try hard things, difficult things, learn how to deal with failure, get up, go back in until you're, until you're successful. So study hard, work hard, never, ever, ever be afraid of failure. And particularly for the, the young black and Hispanic kids that you work with and the women, don't let people define you. Don't let anybody tell you what you can or cannot do. You define yourselves. You set your own goals and then you drive yourself to success. So, um, and then take care of everybody around you. So that, that's it. 
Charlie, this has been incredible. Definitely my bright moment of the day. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time and your experience. And we're really excited um, to have our, our students be able to hear from you. And hopefully, you know, we'll get a couple of um, astronauts out of this conversation. So I'm excited. Uh, so. <laughs> Tell the kids who wrote the book. I love it. Tell them. Oh, yes. We will make sure my, that we show them. Heroes. They're my heroes. <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we will absolutely um, look forward to hearing more from um, our future Fireside Chats. And thank you so much again, Charlie, for joining us today. Thank you. You take care. You too.